Hello, everybody, and welcome to this ISRF webinar celebrating Oche Onazi's recently published book, An African Path to Disability Justice. I'll shortly be handing over to ISRF Director of Research, Chris Newfield, who will be hosting the event tonight. But before I do so, I'm just going to quickly go over some housekeeping. We are using Zoom webinar today, which means that only panelists will have their cameras and microphones activated for the duration of the event. If you would like to ask a question during the Q&A session, please use Zoom's Q&A function. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which you can use to submit short questions for any of tonight's speakers. You can also read and upload questions that other people have submitted to indicate your interest in that question being asked. A curated selection of questions will be put to the panelists towards the end of the event, but please do note that we may not have the time to cover every question that is being asked in the Q&A box tonight. We're scheduled to run for about 75 minutes, but we will certainly aim to finish by 6.30 p.m. UK time. We are also recording the event tonight, and we aim to circulate a link to the video to all attendees in the next week or so. Finally, we'll also be sending around a feedback form tomorrow. And because this is only our second public webinar, we would be very grateful to hear from you about your experience and your opinion of the event. Okay, that's all from me. I'm going to be handing over to Chris Newfield to introduce the event and our speakers tonight. Oh, this is the second uh, in the ISRF series of discussions as Lars just mentioned. Uh, with fellows who have recently published books related to their foundation research. And we're going to continue these through winter and spring. Uh, upcoming events will discuss Kian O'Driscoll's book, Victory, the Triumph and Tragedy of Just War, Gabor Shearing's The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, Authoritarian Capitalism and the Accumulative State in Hungary, and Craig Jones's new book, The War Lawyers, the United States, Israel, and juridical warfare. <laughs> you can see kind of a running theme there. Many conflicts, but also their potential resolutions are gonna be coming up. Um, the first book in our launch series was Annalyn de Dang's uh, recent work, Freedom and Unruly History. As some of you know, her book covers 2,500 years of efforts in the global North to ground freedom in democratic self-determination rather than in our now conventional understanding of freedom as private liberty. Um, ISRF fellows regularly dispute and then move beyond conventional understandings. And Oche Onazi mounts his own sustained critique of political liberalism as having largely failed to be disability inclusive, as having not provided adequate foundations for disability justice. He also outlines an alternative, which he calls a new public culture of obligations one that emerges from his reading of African legal philosophical contexts. Okay, so we have the author and noted experts here to discuss what these and other key terms mean. So I'm not gonna blow this by saying much more about it myself, uh, but I do wanna say a word about the importance of the topic. Uh, many of us have direct experience with the struggles for everyday life of people living with disabilities, perhaps as the result of an injury or serious illness or adult onset of a condition like multiple sclerosis or a birth condition like cerebral palsy in the case of my own youngest sibling. Those of us who've been in the position of supporting someone's basic everyday needs have a vocabulary by which we explain to ourselves and others what we are doing. Often it involves terms like dignity, but whatever the terms are, they are often ad hoc and emerge out of real, but also sometimes isolated and isolating experience. Uh, in my family, the phrase we used was giving him a life, no modifier necessary. Everyone knew what that meant, even though we knew the term was unsatisfactory and unintentionally condescending. And we never used it outside the family, uh, certainly not at events like this one. Um, a great thing about uh, Dr. Oche Anazi's book is that it provides the kind of systematic philosophical and legal vocabulary that many of us operating in the field, as it were, have lacked. It also grounds its framework in African traditions that are neglected in the North Atlantic world, present company accepted. Uh, for me, they've opened up new horizons. Uh, the book is also a, surprisingly really for a, a very intense work of a philosophical analysis, a compelling read. 
Uh, when I first picked it up, I used the table of contents to review the chapters, the subheadings, and the sub subheadings. I thought, okay, I know about, for example, the human, the universal human rights concept, and I know about the human capabilities approach. So I can skip sections 3.2.1 through 3.2.3, and I'll skip 4.2 and 4.3, and just read the conclusion to chapter four and so on. So I thus organized my anticipatory abridged version of Oche. And then I started to read and I found myself reading the intro and then the next section and the next section and then every section. And I skipped nothing, including the, the very compelling analysis of Nussbaum, who's somebody that I thought I knew very well. And I saved no time and I read the entire book. And I have to say it was fascinating. The, the main issues that it synthesizes, the elements that it brings together and so I'm really, I'm very excited that you are here, Oche, along with our two distinguished guests uh, to dig into this. Okay, so Oche is going to introduce the book and speak for something like 10 minutes, although of course we're not gonna cut him off if he goes on. And then we will, um, I will introduce Tom Shakespeare and Julie Maybe in turn. So I will just say something about Oche now and then turn it over to him. Oche Onazi grew up in Jos, Nigeria. He took law degrees from the University of Jos and of Warwick. He also holds a PhD from the University of Edinburgh. He has taught at Dundee and Southampton and is currently senior lecturer in law at the University of Northumbria. He is also a qualified but non-practicing barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. Oche's research covers two related themes, First, it covers the theoretical study of law from Southern perspectives and the critical approaches of other disciplines, such as sociology, politics, history, and philosophy, all of which are indeed in this book. The second strand covers the role of law in development, especially the relationship between human rights and development, community approaches to development, and the relationship between human rights from the philosophical perspectives of the Global South, his previous book, which I also recommend, is called Human Rights from Community, a rights-based approach to development, which appeared in 2013. Oshie, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Take it away. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you about my book. Um, but let me start by expressing my profound gratitude to the foundation for funding this project um, would have been possible uh, without uh, energy from the foundation. I'm also extremely honored and grateful to professors Julie Maybe and Tom Shakespeare for taking the time to read my book. And I look forward to gaining from your invaluable insights. Uh, what I'll try to do uh, very briefly is to talk about the central motivation for writing this book, and then I uh, would briefly outline um, what I was trying to achieve in the book. I started thinking about this book mainly because of the lack of attention to disability and people with disabilities in the most attractive literature on the concept of community in African contemporary philosophy. And so rather than the conventional human rights approach um, and the religious approach, I specifically became interested in exploring what a legal philosophy of disability justice would look like from an African national ideal. And looking at the literature in African philosophy, although most writers talk about an African concept of community, um, I think they mean two different but related things. Predominantly, although the concept of community is seen as an attribute of a group, it also refers to a relational ideal 
founded on ethical and horizontal obligations between people that may or may not comprise it. And so apart from presupposing a compassion-based or moral civic order, what is attractive about this version of community is that it's formed through relationships. It's not a metaphysical entity or it does not have an existence that is separate or takes precedence over its members. And one of the most attractive definitions of this concept of community is provided by Drusilla Cornell. She eloquently describes the community as something that is not outside us, something over there, but is inscribed in us. What she means is that community is an interactive ethic or an ontic orientation, which who and how we can be as human beings is always shaped in our interaction with each other. So what Cornell importantly draws our attention to is not just how the community is formed or constituted, but importantly, how the process of constituting the community defines what it means to be a person. And personhood in this context is achieved, earned, or granted only to those who can discharge the obligations to others. In other words, personhood is dependent on a type of mutual reciprocity between each member of the community. By contrast, those who cannot form the obligations are not considered as persons. They are only human beings, which is a lower or inferior moral status. So it's this distinction or hierarchy between persons and human beings that for me presents difficulties for people with disabilities, especially people with cognitive and extreme physical disabilities. It does not necessarily lead to the denial of their status as human beings. Rather, it leads to their inferior status and makes them less worthy of moral consideration. This to me explains why people with disabilities tend to be missing from the demanding standards of mutual obligations, synonymous with being part of a relational unity or indeed any type of African unity. So although my book takes the relational conception of community as its core element of defining disability justice, it relies on a different conception of person one that appears to be inclusive of people with disabilities. My proposals are modeled on the insole conception of personhood, which is associated or is derived from the insole people of Southern Cameroon. And unlike the dominant conception of personhood, this one does not rigidly define individuals or place them in a hard analytical frame by specifying the necessary and sufficient criteria of being human. It makes no distinction between persons and human beings, and it does not rank human beings according to their individuating features, whether this is age, status, or disability. It's open-ended or non-essentialist and it accommodates changes in the characteristics of human beings. 
The advantage of this conception of personhood for me is that it widens the scope of people to whom obligations are owed. Since moral consideration of others is not contingent on individual features. Being a human being is the only criteria to be the recipient of the obligations of others. So this is my starting point. And from this sort of foundation, I treat the relational conception of community as the ethical foundation of my proposed legal philosophy of disability justice. And I present it as its first principle and source of other principles of disability. And once the relational conception of community is taken as a core element of disability justice, it importantly brings to the agenda the importance of relationships. And here, focus of the approach is on the kind of relationships that elude people with disabilities, as well as the social and cultural beliefs or perceptions that prevent them from a community experience due to their bodily, sensory, or mental elements. The focus on relationships not only sheds light on the exclusion that people with disabilities in Africa experience, but also the kinds of interventions that can be made to include them into community relationships. And so from this perspective, issues like poverty can be understood not just economically, but as a factor that prevents people with disabilities from experiencing or sharing community with others. The same can be said about the lack of access to healthcare, food, education, housing, or employment opportunities. They are all obstacles to sharing community levels. And thirdly, the third ideal I speak about is about obligations, the obligations that should be owed to people with disabilities, either by the state or people and I'd say people without disabilities. So in contrast to the routine characterization of obligations in African philosophy as symmetrical concepts. I propose an asymmetrical conception of obligations as a more attractive and inclusive approach since it does not stringently demand mutual reciprocity. And so I argue that once the symmetry is appreciated and taken seriously, then it's much easier to justify and extend obligations to people with disability. And this is something that, looking at the literature in African philosophy, is quite difficult because of the inherent neutrality of the obligations. So, in combination, these ideals, community, relationships and obligations serve as a criterion for evaluating, criticizing and modifying the existing legal and political institutions, as well as for creating new ones to ensure that they include people with disabilities within the range of relationships characteristic of a community. Through these ideals, the proposed legal philosophy of disability justice mainly becomes an aid to critically evaluate whether people with disabilities are part and parcel of various forms of community life. Therefore, disability injustice is simply the exclusion of people with disabilities from those forms of community. So, although the scope of the book 
So we need to set out what an African philosophy of disability justice would look like. I go a bit further in outlining how to realize these ob obligations in practice. And in spite of its limitations, I turn to tax as a bridging concept that can transform moral obligations into legally binding commitments of people without disabilities to people with disabilities. So tax here is not just a source of revenue, but an instrument that helps members of the community share the burdens of living together, which must entail taking care of the most vulnerable amongst them. So tax here can be as a potential to be used to translate the moral obligations of people without disabilities into resources that can be channeled to removing the numerous barriers that prevent the full inclusion of people with disabilities into community. I'll stop it. Thank you. Oh, that's great, Oche. Thank you very much. Uh, I am now going to introduce our first um, commentator, who is Tom Shakespeare. Uh, Tom Shakespeare has degrees in social and political science from Cambridge University, and he is currently professor of disability research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He was technical officer at the World Health Organization of Geneva, where he co-authored and co-edited the World Report on Disability came in 2011 and International Perspectives on Spinal Cord Injury in 2014. He conducts qualitative social research with disabled people in the UK and Africa, exploring social and economic consequences of impairment and illness and disabled people's sexual and reproductive rights, disabled childhoods, resilience and success for disabled people in Africa, independent living and social care, rights-based rehabilitation, mental health recovery, as well as bioethics as it pertains to disabled people. And I actually cut the list down of his interests to that. He is a, a principal investigator of the project Succeed, uh, which co-produces and evaluates multidisciplinary approaches to psychosis in several African countries. He supervises a team evaluating the LCD led I2I disability employment program in Kenya and Bangladesh, and is also conducting research in Zambia, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Nigeria, and Malawi, among other African countries. He is currently working on disability inclusive responses to COVID-19, which seek to prevent COVID-19 from worsening the poverty and other challenges faced by many people living with disabilities globally. And his publications include two books, The Sexual Politics of Disability from 1996, uh, Disability Rights and Wrongs in 2006 and 2014, and actually a third book, uh, Disability, The Basics from 2017. Tom, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, Chris. And in your kind uh, introduction, you can see a fundamental problem in my CV, which is that I tend to treat things uh, fairly uh, superficially. And that's why I was so pleased to see this book, because back in 2000, I wrote a short book uh, called Help, and I referred to the concept of Ubuntu. Um, this uh, idea that's found in the work of John and Beatty and that I got from Desmond Tutu is all about, I think, an aspect of uh, what um, Oche is talking about here, um, of uh, this communitarian philosophy uh, in Africa. And I didn't, I just referred to it. What you get in this book is a thorough scholarly legal philosophy of uh, this uh, 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 non-reciprocal altruism, which is so profoundly helpful for disability scholars in the global North, let alone the global South. Many of us have some skepticism about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is the only show in town when it comes to legal rights and disability. It's so individualist. 
It excludes the family. It doesn't have enough to say about community. And therefore we find it lacking. And we turn to, I don't know, uh, Martha Nussbaum's capability theory, and we find all sorts of problems with that. And then uh, uh, Eva Federkide's wonderful critique of John Rawls, but she's still within the, 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 the uh, contractarian tradition of John Rawls. And then Oche comes along and shows us by analyzing all those people exactly how limited they are. And that this individualism is like the, the water within a fish within which a fish swims, that uh, failure to uh, understand uh, its dominance accounts for many of these problems. As he says beautifully, it's not just rights, it's also love and compassion, which should influence our relations with each other. And I find it a very, very helpful contribution to my thinking. So um, what can I ask? What can I critique? Well, I think it's really important uh, for us to build empathy between non-disabled and disabled people. I think it's really important to draw on values of solidarity, which are not uniquely African, but are global. Um, what I worry about, Oche, is you talk about simulation exercises. Now, I can understand why it's helpful to understand what it might be like to be disabled, but um, uh, I think what it is to be disabled, it's an experience of injustice as much as uh, an experience of impairment. It's bad treatment in society, not just being unable to walk or see. So I do think that some educational intervention is vital. I think that it has to go long and wide beyond uh, simulation exercises. And I wanted to, to challenge you on that and ask whether you'd still hold that, which you wrote in the book whenever it was first produced. Um, the other question I have for you arises from uh, my experience, uh, limited as it is, of researching in Africa. I remember talking to a guy and he was successful. He was a tailor on a street market in Lusaka and he had three children, he had a partner and he was doing, he was not rich, but he was not struggling in the way that poverty and begging implies. And I said, how do you account for your success? And he said, the grace of God. And so in Africa, as we know, there is a tremendous, you know, colonial influence. I don't know, but there's a tremendous emphasis on Christianity. And at least I'm not saying that the grace of God had nothing to do with it, but in his case, the grace of God was expressed through his sister who bought him the sewing machine, which enabled him to learn a living. His brother-in-law who paid for the lessons that enabled him to be a productive street tailor. And um, for example, the man in the street who saw him limping and brought him a crutch. So the grace of God was through people. Um, and uh, I was interested in this. Um, uh, when I worked in Africa, so many people I interviewed, they said I was the only person in my family who went to school. And then you had, they're actually educating their siblings. They're educating their younger children in their family. Uh, perhaps they're even educating unrelated orphans from their village. So there, there is clearly a tremendous emphasis in many traditional African communities on uh, uh, helping everybody, not just helping number one. Um, how much does this owe to Christianity? Um, uh, where does that fit in within your uh, uh, scheme of things uh, is, is a, a, a question uh, I'd also like to ask. Um, I think this book will uh, be helpful to all of us theorizing disability in the years ahead. I hope you don't stop with this. I hope you continue with it because, and I, you know, I, I would love to have arguments with you, not arguments, discussions with you uh, in person after this terrible virus, uh, because uh, there's so much to learn, understand and grow with in this book. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Tom. Our next commentator is uh, Julie Maybe, uh, coming to us uh, directly from New Jersey. Is that correct? Uh, she has a BA from Carleton University and an MA and a PhD from Cornell University. She is a present professor of philosophy at Lehman College, where she is the director of the Interdisciplinary Disability Studies Program. She also teaches in the Disability Studies Master's Program 
for CUNY's uh, City University of New York School of Professional Studies. Her research areas include 19th century continental philosophy, particularly the work of Hegel, African philosophy, race and philosophy, and disability studies. What unites her specialties is an overriding interest in the way socially defined differences, as well as time and place, shape people's identities, knowledge, and experiences. To note only recent publications, Professor Maybe has written the entry on Hegel's dialectics for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a, quite a daunting, <laughs> intimidating task. Uh, she has published a, a monograph, Making and Unmaking Disability, the Three-Body Approach, and is currently finishing a book on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. She has also recently published two pieces that are particularly intersect with our topic tonight, one called African Philosophy, Disability and the Social Conception of the Self, and the second called Homelessness, Disability and Oppression in a volume about the ethics of homelessness, philosophical perspectives. Julie, many thanks for being here. Well, uh, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity and um, thanks uh, to Oche for a terrific book. And I agree with uh, Tom that it was a, a great read. Um, so uh, I came to disability studies and the philosophy of disability long after I had been working on African philosophy. When I started working in disability studies, I was already familiar with African philosophers' discussions of the relatively widespread communalistic values that can be found in a number of different individual cultures on the African continent, as well as the ways in which these values shape African philosophers' discussions of ethics. I was also familiar with criticisms of what African scholars argued, and Tom, you referred to this, is the overly individualistic Western conception of human rights. So Kwasi Wiradu and Kwame Jeche, for instance, as well as African political scientist Claude Ake have criticized the traditional Western view that individual rights are absolute, arguing that such a conception is contrary to African communalism. Wiradu also criticized the list of rights that Western Westerners typically offer for leaving out more communalistic rights that would have been recognized in his own culture of birth, uh, the Akan culture, such as the right of an infant to have nourishment. As Ake suggested in a 1989 article, the idea of a quote, largely autonomous individual conceived as a bundle of rights which are asserted against all comers has not really developed much, especially outside the urban areas in Africa. Ake argued that an African conception of rights would have to be less abstract, would have to mean something to poor people, for example, the right to work, a living wage, shelter, health, or education, and would have to be implemented in a political context in which the common people can exercise those rights. Oche mentions this criticism as well. In Africa, quote, the litmus test for rights uh, okay, suggested echo echoing communalistic values, quote, is those who need protection. Unfortunately, these are precisely the people who are in no position to enjoy rights. Clearly that will not do in African conditions. People are not going to struggle for formalities and esoteric ideas which will not change their lives. When I came to disability studies later, I immediately noticed the values often supported by disability activists and scholars echoed those discussed by African philosophers. In his 2003 book, Why I Burned My Book and Other Essays on Disability, for instance, Paul Longmore argued that the disability justice movement needs to shift to a second phase. While the first phase fo focused on fighting for disability rights, he argued, the second phase should focus on building a disability culture. This culture would be rooted in and affirm values drawn from the experience experiences of disabled people themselves, values that he suggested are opposed to the values espoused by what he called hyper-individualistic uh, non-disabled majority. In particular, he said, disabled people have found that they quote, prize not self-sufficiency, but self-determination, not independence, but interdependence, not functional separateness, but personal connection, not physical autonomy, but human community. 
this value formation takes disability as the starting point. It uses the disability experience as the source of values and norms. Because of the close connections I saw between African and disability values, I have weaved discussion of, discussions of African philosophy into my own thinking about liberation strategies for disabled people. But Oche offers an ingenious and direct way of bringing these values together. He proposes that we simply build a communalistic conception of disability justice based on African values. This conception, as, as you mentioned, Oche, can be used not only to design new institutions and social structures that will ensure that they are consistent with and pursue disability justice, but also to assess existing institutions and social structures. Oche's main interest is in developing a conception of disability justice for the African context. As John Murungi notes in his foreword, Oche's goal is to use African resources, namely communalistic conceptions of value that are already fairly widespread in Africa, to mobilize Africans to implement policies that will address what he describes as the dire conditions that many disabled people face in many African countries. But like Tom, I think his proposal is appealing for any country. Um, so I want to start by saying a few words about his view. I had, uh, he, Oche, you actually covered some of this in your introduction. So I hope it won't be too repetitive. I'll try to skip over things you already said. Um, so the main difference between Western conceptions of individual rights and communalistic approaches uh, which I suggest is that communal, communalistic approaches privilege duties, or as he prefers to call them, obligations to others over rights. As he mentioned, he uh, contrasts Ifeani if Menkidi's group-based conception of community with Thaddeus Metz's relational conception of community, and he prefers the latter over the former. Uh, Mankiti's group-based conception emphasizes vertical relationships between the individual and the com community, conceived of as a particular group, a clan, or more broadly, perhaps a culture. This uh, conception of community is typically tied to what we can think of as a prescriptive concept of the person. A descriptive concept of personhood just describes what a person is, whereas a prescriptive concept of a person says what a good person should be. And according to the pre prescriptive conception of a person, one can be more or less of a person depending on the amount of personhood you have earned in the community by performing your obligations in relation to the community. In my view, Oche rightly argues that this view poses problems for disability justice. Like traditional Western capacity-based conceptions of personhood, in which personhood is defined in terms of people's rational capacities, for instance, grounding a conception of personhood in a capacity for carrying out obligations to the community risks excluding some disabled people from full personhood. Um, there is another criticism of, of group-based conceptions of community that Oche doesn't mention that I think would be friendly uh, to your view, Oche. Um, so the feminist philosopher Uma Narayan, for example, has criticized the reification of culture in many third world countries. She argues that calls to preserve culture are often used to reinforce existing power hierarchies in those societies, particularly power hierarchies in which men exert power over women. In fact, she suggests cultures are never really monolithic. A similar criticism might be made against group-based accounts of the community, which tend to reify, so treat as monolithic and unchanging, treat as a thing, the group in question. Metz's relational conception is a much better conception uh, for uh, Oche's goals, and I think Oche, you're right in preferring his account. Um, in that conception, human relationships are the basis of community. It emphasizes horizontal relationships, as you mentioned, Oche, so person to person rather than person to community, vertical relationships. On Metz's view, communities are flexible 
So they can change over time, they can be multiple, they can be interlocking. So this avoids the reification of groups uh, that Narayan criticizes. Um, still, uh, his view emphasizes reciprocal relationships and the idea that personhood is earned, though Oche uh, suggests that it's modal. Uh, so it's not what uh, interpersonal relationship a person in fact has, but the interpersonal relationships that a person could have, that's the modal aspect. It's therefore somewhat more open to altruism. But I think Oche is right to be skeptical of basing a conception of personhood on any kind of capacity. Um, uh, he therefore rejects the prescriptive account of personhood as you described Oche in your introduction in favor of a purely dis descriptive account that makes no distinction between a human being and a person. Um, and I think uh, that's the right way to go. A person's moral status as a human being entitles the person to be part of the community relationships. And that's the end of the story. Disability injustice is now defined then for Oche as quote, the set of obstacles or features of a society that curtail a person's ability to take part, share or experience different forms of community relationships. And disability justice is the obligation to create and evaluate political and legal institutions that quote, promote, nurture, strengthen and sustain communal relationships and the experiences of people with disabilities, unquote. Because Oche's account does not require personhood to be earned, he also brings in, as, as you mentioned Oche, uh, the view that obligations are asymmetrical, altruistic, and they're not super erogatory. So, um, in terms of asymmetrical, they take human dependence seriously and recognize that human relationships are typically asymmetrical. That's something that we saw a long more emphasize in the passage that I read from his book. Um, so taking dependence seriously. Um, this is not to say, as Oche emphasizes several times in the book, that disabled people cannot reciprocate in human relations, just that the obligation itself is not based on uh, mutuality or reciprocation. Nothing needs to be returned to ground the obligation, as Oche says. Um, it also, at, there are no obligations that are super erogatory or beyond the call of duty. Um, so justice thus requires us to build, as Oche puts it, a new public culture of obligations to people with disabilities. In my own work, I've criticized various social institutions and structures for excluding disabled people. And I've urged us to unmake disability or find ways to remove the disabling aspects of our institutions and structures to include disabled people. I've paid particular attention to capitalism as one of the main structures of institutions that not only in my view constructed disability as a social category, but also has led to the exclusion of people defined as disabled, not only from the economic system, but from our social world more generally. We can use Oche's proposal, I think, as a test for our existing social structure. So I just wanna take a moment to, uh, to say what that would look like. Um, in the case of capitalism, capitalism's exclusion of disabled people from being able to participate in what is regarded as a genuine economic activity, as well as the social consequences of that exclusion are unjust on Oche's account because they violate our obligations to promote communal relationships with and the experiences of disabled people. Um, as you mentioned, Oche, uh, because your book is sensitive to the idea that proposals for justice, as Ake mentioned, need to be uh, persuasive or will be persuasive if they can be only if they can be practically implemented, um, you offer two accounts or two examples of how they could be imp implemented, like Tom. Um, uh, one form, so one of the things you suggest is that. Um, countries should implement civic and citizenship education programs. Uh, and um, the example you give that you mentioned, Tom, also is uh, you, that you would ask non-disabled people 
to take part in disability simulations on an organized basis. Um, uh, your argument is that providing non-disabled people with a phenomenological experience of disability would help them build empathy for disabled people, which could then be leveraged to encourage non-disabled people to fulfill obligations towards disabled people. And while you're aware of some of the criticisms of disability simulations in the book, um, you still think they, they could be an important mechanism for encouraging non-disabled people to carry out their obligations to disabled people. Like Tom, though, I'm much more skeptical. <laughs> Um, so Adrian Ash, for example, uh, once said to me in a personal conversation that asking, you know, putting a blindfold on a sighted person will just scare the person because they have not had the time to develop the alternative skills that allowed her to navigate the world without sight. So in my book, I talk about uh, disabled people having corporeal powers that are complicit with their vulnerabilities. Uh, Tobin Sievers has argued that because non-disabled people have not developed the corresponding corporeal powers, as I put it, they will become so frightened by the bodily aspects of simulations that they will be unable to notice the ways in which disability is socially caused. So I'm less optimistic that disability simulations will be effective in developing the kind of empathy that will actually lead to the social change that would be needed for disabled people to be fully included in our social relationships and our world. Here, here you know, there's research on um, you know, how relationships, uh, be, so equal relationships between people help to build empathy, hierarchical relationships don't. Um, so you know, I, I'm not sure that might be one promising way to go to promote it's a bit of a um, vicious circle, though, because to have those kind of equal relationships, you already have to have inclusion. But of course, part of the problem is that we don't have inclusion. So, you know, but but I'm skeptical about disability simulations. Um, I do find the tax proposal uh, persuasive. Um, Oche proposes that disability justice could be pursued through, pursued through tax schemes, perhaps even hypothecated tax schemes, such as an alcohol tax in which the money goes to a national disability service charged with dispersing funds to support disabled people. Uh, these sorts of schemes would be justified as a way in which non-disabled people would be living up to their obligations uh, to disabled people, which I think is a wonderful argument. Um, while Oche is aware that there might be limitations to being able to implement such tax schemes in Africa due to poverty, for example, or opposition to the consumption of alcohol, for instance, in, in the case of that kind of scheme. Um, I think that the account of disability justice provides just the right justification for tax schemes used to support disabled people, as well as other people in a society who need help. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Well, that's really helpful, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, we have a lineup already of uh, five questions. I just want to explain to the audience, we can't see you up here. We can see the Q&A, which is then because I can't do two things at the same time, is being uh, assembled by Lars and sent into our chat. So it's sort of two removes and I apologize to everybody for that. But we're going to do our best to um, get through all the questions that have been, gotten put into the chat. Um, Oche, do you want to say um, one word back to these folks before we go into the questions? Uh, just to say uh, thank you very much for the comments. Um, they're very helpful. Um, and I, I agree with entirely everything that you said. Um, <laughs> And perhaps, first of all, to respond to the question about religion that Tom um, highlights. Um, I think in, in Africa that can be an important, an important source of alleviation, can be 
sorry, I seem to have been muted. Yeah, okay. So in response to question about Christianity and, and generally religion in Africa, um, I think on the one hand, I think it has created the problem um, in certain interpretations of the Bible that um, uh, you know, discriminate or disparage people with disabilities. And on the other hand, um, especially when you look at the absence of the state, especially the more recent um, African experience, where the state doesn't touch the lives of a joint of poor, all they've had have been religious institutions. So, in some ways, they are the mercy of the preachers, the pastors, the imams, and most of them, in my view, wrongly interpreted, interpret what uh, the doctrines suggest, explain their conditions, what it should be. Um, so religion for me can be force for good, but I think for the most part, it does contribute to that status of most people with disability as uh, sometimes something like curse from God or otherwise. But I think both comments, I, I agree entirely with, with Julie about um, interpretation of what I was trying to do and the problem with it. And those are problems that I had. And one specific problem is taking literally what obligations entail in African philosophy. Um, and literally translating it into practice. And I do talk about this book. And so tax for me seemed to be an attractive mechanism that um, because of its obligatory nature, but also that would depend on uh, the ability to pay tax. But coming back to the question of simulation, um, I think that idea comes to me from Simone Weil, where she talks about human suffering and understanding suffering. And Simone Weil's work, and thanks to my supervisor, who is supervisor, who hopefully is here. Um, is skeptical about rights, skeptical because of its um, epistemic quality to just see and recognize suffering in society. And Simone Weil's response to that question is about education, so it's about the idea of attention and tension is literally going through that phenological experience of feeling or going through what the person uh, in pain or in need experiences. I do acknowledge that is not possible disability. But I think that, and perhaps this is from my experience growing up in Nigeria and um, before coming to the UK, so I can't really speak about other parts of Africa, that there has to be something that enables people 
to come to terms of what it means to live in that sort of society with a disability. If simulations don't do that, then something else is and that is what I was trying to argue, not that I thought that simulations were the, or are the ideal way in which to get that. Because, and that is, I think, something about the broad approach that I take that unfortunately, and this ties in with something that Judy was saying about capitalism, that it's capitalism has had a decisive impact on Africa. And many of those very attractive worldviews, especially the idea of community, are simply being lost. So it's not, maybe it sounds like the traditional sociological critique, but I think that is becoming evident. So how do we re-engage with what is attractive? I'm not saying that everything is attractive, but I think that compassionate-based relational approach is what should hold and it can be potentially uh, not just attractive to Africans, but what Africans can give to the world. So maybe I'll stop that. <laughs> right, thank you, Oche. We have um, five really good questions lined up. We have about 15 minutes scheduled. We're due to stop a uh, uh, quarter after the hour. We need a little bit of extra time. I, we are allowed to take it. Uh, but so that gives us another two or three minutes piece for the ones that are already in the chat box. Um, these are redacted. Uh, the first is from Jackie Lovell. Um, Oche, how is your philosophical analysis, which uh, prefers relationality over, over other modes of uh, community, different from feminist relational approaches? If it indeed is. I don't think it's very different. Um, if there are any distinctions that it's quite um, minimum, minimal or small. And um, interestingly, in the book, I talk about how um, relational feminists found African philosophy quite attractive, unlike the communitarian tradition. And perhaps they they do share a lot of similarities than oppositions. First, on the status of the individual, the autonomous individual, um, I think they're quite united rejecting um, the primacy of individual rights. Um, they both recognize the importance of um, family and social arrangements. And they also um, are, uh, would I say, important, recognize the importance of nurturing uh, empathy and moral conformity to others. But I think they do so in slightly different ways. Uh, in African uh, philosophy, the emphasis is on patience which are mutual, but in relational feminism is about dependency, which I think is not a symmetrical experience. It recognizes that um, there is an asymmetry involved. And I do argue in the book that, um, even though I don't emphasize it, that I think African philosophy can learn from relational feminism that respect. And perhaps what distinguishes the two, even though not all strands of feminism, uh, is on the concept of community. I would say 
most feminists would reject, um, especially because of gender-based uh, justices. Thank you. Actually, we're, we're trying to dampen that clicking. Um, next question from Julia Modern. I am very interested in the concept of asymmetrical uh, obligations. My question is, what are the limits of obligation? In particular, how long will people keep helping and giving in the context of extreme material deprivation? This is relevant in an instance of the hungry season, but COVID-19 also prompts this question. I think that's a great question and an important observation. And um, I'm not sure I can accurately uh, understand, but I think that is the point of the relational conception of community in African philosophy, the point of um, its emphasis on altruism and empathy, the point of sharing. So it's not sufficiently having, uh, whether it's resources or being a, a condition of power that you can, uh, it's, it's not about that. It's, 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 it's recognizing that you are in a position to help the other. And there is no limit to that. And that is why in African philosophy, obligations are not separate, they are compulsory. Help the person in distress is mandatory. You risk being criticized or penalized for doing the read the words of Veritas. And I think that's that's why uh, it is feeling strong. Uh, it's not an option. Um, little we have. And believe me, I have personally experienced that. And I can talk about the story, but I have seen that people coming from uh, perhaps a more opulent background going to a negotiation that had nothing to do When I said no, they, 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 they were offended. That was the end of the conversation. So it's, it's obligatory. It's not. Great. This, this next question is a kind of an extension or a follow-up to that from Agamoni Ganguly Amitra. Oche's argument depends on the concept of vulnerability. What is the role, if any, of vulnerability in justifying obligations in the context of asymmetrical reciprocity? I think that is that's a good question as well. I think that is central because the relational conception the uh, altruistic interpretation of the relational conception is always calling you to recognize the vulnerable, those that are in a um, inferior position than you are. It's, it, it invites you to see them, to recognize that that exists in society. And you have an obligation, a blindness to a system. Um, so there is, perhaps in the literature as far as I know, there is no specific definition of what it is to be vulnerable, but it talks about uh, several conditions of ability, whether it's children, whether it's the elderly, be um, whether it's sick, but be what was interesting is that there's very little said about conditions of disability. But I agree that uh, the central understanding of the patients in the other, that is the emphasis. Right. Okay, there are two more in this set and then two more to follow. So we have four remaining. Uh, Steve Gravy, this feels in some ways closer to a theory of charity than one of justice as understood politically. 
What would OCHA's response be to the critiques of charity as perpetuating injustice from both disabled people's movements in countries like the UK and the US and from post-colonial theorists of global exploitation? <laughs> yeah, it's a very difficult question, but I would say that the, the absence of separate acts in African philosophy tries to, if you like, avoid that criticism. So that if you think of things from degrees of justice in uh, Western you know, philosophies, then there is that distinction between um, uh, charity and, and justice. But in African philosophy, at least the work of or see where it is, argues precisely against that. Um, and that's why he rejects rights, because he doesn't think you can come to that kind of understanding. So in this respect, um, I think the only, um, well, at least that comes across, I'm sure the others, but this is what, again, is attractive about Simone Day's work, because for her, Justice is charity. Justice is love. It's not vice things. It's not about rights. And for her, only love can lead to the deep understanding of what it means to suffer. And, and I think Tom, yes, Levinas, and I don't claim to be an expert on it. Yeah, I agree. I understand. Tom, are you wanted to come in? Sorry, I certainly don't want to take away from you, uh, Oche, but I was so excited to hear you talk about Simone Weil, and it just reminded me of Emmanuel Levinas, and it's you know his his concept was of the face. What you have is face to face, and that is a obligation. Um, uh, uh, that arises in a sort of primal sense. And I was reminded of that as I read your book, that's all. All right, next question comes from Patricia Smith. Uh, what do you think are the influences of, of culture on disability justice? Which are indeed, these are two terms that are working together pretty consistently throughout the book. Yes, uh, and In, in one, I think that's a great question. And I think in one kind of response, um, that was part of the most motivation for the book in the sense that when you looked at some of the literature, so when I say that there is a lack of attention to disability, you do find um, some kind of anthropological type of descriptions of perceptions of disability. And that is often tied to different ethnic groups or tribes. And there was very little, even though um, there was something about it as to how to respond to those types of exclusion. So what I was trying to do in the book is to, first of all, accept that there is a prevalence in negative perceptions of disability, but also look at disability internally from those, what I call the attractive values in the African culinary tradition, and to use that as a basis to criticize those negative perceptions. So I do acknowledge in the book that that will depend, I think this is something that Pasi Verdi discusses, on 
if all African moral concepts like Ubuntu are culturally conditioned, if they're cultural concepts. And I don't think they all are, especially the way in which Ubuntu has been used. It's not necessarily about a particular urban group, or there is a kind of so it's to find those kind of things uh, to respond to some of the conditions of disability. Right, we have two more uh, huge, great questions that we should spend at least an hour on. I'm just going to read them to you in, in as a duo. The first is from Abdul Paliwala, and the second is anonymous. First, what are Oche's reasons for explaining to ex for explaining the absence of Ubuntu in contemporary Africa in situations such as the discrimination against albinos in Tanzania or against LGBT in many countries? And the second question, anonymous, is what role do you think religion, spirituality, and tribe play in the proposals or recommendations you make for disability justice in Africa? <laughs> Thank you for great questions. Um, Thank you, Abdul. Abdul uh, is my mentor from Warwick, so I'm grateful for that very difficult question. Um, I would say that um, I don't take the conventional starting point about Ubuntu that it's universal across Africa. And I don't take that premise that African philosophy has had an impact on African legal policy. I think that has not happened. And that is because of my conception of African philosophy as discipline similar to philosophy in the West. But there is another way of looking at it to say that African philosophy is describing the cultural beliefs of African. I don't think those two things can be separated. But I, uh, when we talk about Ubuntu, I think the most decisive impact it has had is in South Africa. So what I'm trying to do is avoid making those kind of you know, generalizations about what may be uniform or what may be consensual in Africa. What I'm saying is that there is there are certain attractive concepts that can be made universal. And, and this is perhaps influence from Omiapia, who highlights the pluralism of that. He talks about Ghana, he talks about Nigeria. And he says, concepts travel when we look at pre-colonial Africa, and even, in my opinion, you just have to look at food or music to appreciate that. And so what I'm trying to emphasize in that is the ability for other African contexts to learn from what is attractive in literature. And that's why I think the literature is important, that we can draw from that, rather than um, and this is not negative because I think one feeds the other. Um, the sort of oral tradition tells us what is available, gives us um, what kinds of concepts we can rely on. But I don't think all those concepts, as some writers would suggest, can be generalized. And that is what I do. I'm talking about possibility of um, 
of um, Africans to learn from each other. That's what's important. Yeah, and into his own way, we see that. And, uh, and related to that is that concept of personhood from some emeralds, quite different. Um, the second question was about religion. Sorry, Chris, can you again about what question? role do you think of uh, religion or spirituality and try to play in the proposals you make for disability justice in Africa? Well, what, what I'm trying to do is offer a circular account of disability justice. I say that from the beginning, I'm looking at, at the beginning of the book, I'm looking at what is attractive, I'm being selective. Uh, I'm not just looking at what is attractive or what is plausible. So it just might be that what is attractive and plausible has a religious foundation and there's a tendency to look at or some writers to look at the future in that way. But that's why, on the whole, I avoid um, talking about these things metaphysically, yeah, and I prefer to talk them about, uh, as, or to describe them as normative or ethic ideas. So I think if you, if, if, if one is able to touch them, from those kinds of metaphysical foundations, then it's possible to, if you like, universalize them across the continent. And for me, um, in some ways, that's why law might be important to me. That kind of universality. Thank you, Oche. Um, we are out of time. Julie or Tom, do you have a final thought that you would like to drop on us? I just think there are more conversations to be had. I know that lots of people will be frustrated by this. Um, uh, and I really look forward to Oche as a member of our wider disability studies community, uh, having those conversations because we need this. Um, I think uh, disability studies, in all of the settings that I've experienced it has not included African legal philosophy and that's to the lack the detriment of disability studies so the relation will be reciprocal uh, uh, it will be mutually uh, advantageous uh, whether it'll be down to duty or obligation I, I leave it for Che to explain but uh, thank you for this book there's lots to be said in future yeah d definitely I think um this conversation could go on much longer and um, there is a lot of rich material. Um, so I look forward to further conversations sometime also. And um, we're probably, there aren't too many people who do African philosophy and disability. So hopefully we'll be able to work together in the future. And thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, I would like to thank the audience uh, for bearing with us in the format and also for asking such great questions. Uh, I want to thank Tom for cutting us directly to the vital stakes of the book, to Julie for elaborating its uh, philosophical underpinnings, and to Oche for making such a, an important and uh, profound intervention in such a, a major uh, topic of worldwide importance. So thanks to all of you and good night to those of us in Europe and, and good morning or good afternoon to the rest of you. Take care you all. Thank you for joining us. For ISRF updates and information about future events, please sign up to our mailing list at www.isrf.org forward slash mailing list. Goodbye.